After Craig's initial greeting to the audience, he begins his debate in earnest. He outlines the two things that he'll be defending. One is that atheism has no good argument for it, and secondly, that theism does. He says rather than attacking straw men at this point, he'll just wait for Hitchens to make an argument for atheism. Here's his direct quote. Atheists have tried for centuries to disprove the existence of God, but no one's ever been able to come up with a successful argument. This statement is not shown to be true. In other words, Craig doesn't give an argument why we should believe that atheists have not come up with a successful argument. We're just meant to believe on his word that this is true. Thus, Craig loses a technical point. Dr. Craig then goes on to present the cosmological argument. I'm not going to present his entire argument in entirety here, but suffice it to say that his entire argument boils down to the typical cosmological argument, that the universe had a cause. There really isn't a reason to argue that point. The premises that then extend from there are ones that potentially the atheist, agnostic, naturalist, or materialist, or skeptic in general, should argue against. Mainly that the cause of the universe cannot itself be material. That material objects are always caused by some other material object. And because that's an impossibility, therefore it must be a non-material object that caused the universe. That is the point that Hitchens should have argued against. Hitchens does not argue against those points. So, if the premises are true, or if they're not argued against, the conclusion is inevitable. Craig gets his technical point on this one. Craig then begins to argue the teleological argument. And I am going to summarize this in a very simple manner. He argues that essentially the properties that the universe exhibits cannot be deterministic, and he gives reasons why that is so. Again, his opponent never addresses this. So Craig gets a plus one on a technical level. If his premises are true, his conclusion has to follow, and his opponent says nothing on this matter at all. Craig then goes on to the moral argument. The moral argument takes the form of the disjunctive syllogism. The disjunctive syllogism, or DS, is dependent upon the either-or statement. Either A or B, not B, therefore A. It's a logically valid argumentation format. And the only way to disband it is to show that the either statement is not true. Here the disjunctive syllogism boils down to these two points. Either A, morals are objective and God exists, or B, morals are subjective and God does not exist. Now, in order to show that this is not a disjunctive syllogism, we must show that the either-or statement is not necessarily true. We must give reasons to doubt its truthfulness. Now, normally I would give Craig the point here once again because his opponent never addresses it, but I did find a fallacy and quite a number of problems with this disjunctive syllogism that does cast doubts on whether or not it's a legitimate either-or case, and thus the conclusion is not warranted. Because of this, I'm not going to award Craig the point. But I have to make Hitchens' points for him, so Hitchens definitely isn't going to get the point either. Nonetheless, I do want to analyze this. Now, looking at what Craig says, we know that this is potentially and probably true. We don't have any reasons to doubt this statement in and of itself. So we're going to go ahead and assume that this is true for the sake of the argument to continue. Now, doesn't this entire claim rest upon a potential logical fallacy? The logical fallacy of an appeal to popular ideas or thought. Just because many or most or even all theists and atheists agreed on this point, does that necessarily follow that this point is true? Not necessarily so, because to say that would be to rest our entire argument upon a popular view. So it is not necessarily true because everybody thinks it's true. So if we were to redo the DS, it looks more like this. 
most people agree A or B. But what about those who disagree? What about those who might believe that morals are subjective, but God still exists? Or that morals are objective, but God doesn't exist? Since they are not included in this formula at all, and because they potentially do exist, and arguments have been presented where people have argued that morals are objective but there is no God or that morals are subjective but there is a God, this is not a true DS. And because it's not a true DS, Craig loses a point. Craig then gives the historical argument. Hitchens does bring this up later on, but he doesn't directly refute it, and I do think it's possible to refute a historical argument from different perspectives. Because that's true, and because that Hitchens didn't do it, I'm going to award Craig a point here. This concludes part one. Part two, I'll begin to analyze Hitchens. No one is safe from my analysis. I'll see you then.